so good to us. Let's sing together. Time moves in rhythm with his head. Moment by moment, beat by beat. Rolling through death with kick and stand. No air will be as keeps his feet. In the mind time. Mercy by mercy, no by no We lost the pitch, he moved the score Our way would notice we resolve And it might sound wild But wild is what my heart sings So sing his praise to the other side Cause I When it does, we'll see
is going to be incredible. Can't wait for you to experience the rest of our service. But before we go on, if you're new here, I want to say welcome. We love you. We hope you feel at home here. Thank you for joining us. And we just want to send you a little something to say thanks for hanging out with us. So if you want to pull out your phone right now, you can open up a text and type the word new and send that to 23101. And we just want to send you a $5 Starbucks gift card. Grab a coffee on us. No strings attached. We're just glad that you're here. But hey, we're going to worship in just a moment before we do. Would you know what's coming? Turn around. Get out of your row. Find someone maybe you don't know. Strike up a conversation. And then we're going to keep worshiping.
lift our voices as we as we sing and make songs about Jesus. We have joined the great multitudes of heaven who are gathered around the throne of Yahweh, our heavenly Father, singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Today we have purposely walked into his presence. So now let's just remain here just a moment. Stand in wonder and awe of our great God, who is true, who is faithful, who is just, who is our healer and our redeemer, who calls us by name. Heavenly Father, we worship you by his name. Through your Son, Jesus Christ. Just wait upon the Lord. He will renew our strength. We're here, Lord. We're here, Lord. We speak the name of Jesus. Jesus. Come on, let's wait upon the Lord. He will renew our strength. And if we just wait upon the Lord, He will
Right on. Wow, let's give it up for this band. Come on. Show them your appreciation. Man, week in and week out, this group of people leads us in worship. I just want to say one thing before you sit down. We got in a lot of amazing young leaders in our church. If you guys don't know this guy, his name is Sterling. Sterling plays keys, but he leads me in worship. I was just watching him while he was playing. I was benefiting from watching you, brother. Thank you for leading us. I mean, the team does that, but, but Sterling today, I wanna say thank you. Yeah. Because it says in Psalm 95, it says, sing for joy to the Lord. It says, make a shout to the rock of our salvation. And Sterling was helping me do that today, and I appreciate it, brother. Thank you. Hey guys, why don't you have a seat? We are so glad that you're here today. My name is Lee. If I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, I'm one of the pastors around here. And I had, uh, I had something I wanted to say to lead into our giving moment. And you can blame Andy Chrisman. He, he had that Holy Spirit moment in the middle and I just decided I'm gonna change what I'm gonna say. So bear with me here. But God had laid something on my heart earlier this week and I just wanna share it with you. How many of you know that the Holy Spirit has been active in the mission of God from the very beginning until now? How many of you know that? That's what he's been doing. The Holy Spirit isn't just something that came on the day of Pentecost to, to bless the church. The Holy Spirit has been active from day one. And there's this passage in the Old Testament, Ezekiel 37, and you may know this passage. It's a story about God coming to his prophet Ezekiel and leading him to a valley. And in this valley, it was filled with dry bones, the image of death. And sometimes I get it because I'm there too. I get spiritually dry. I start to feel spiritually empty. Sometimes in my own life, I feel dry. God comes to Ezekiel and he says, you see all these dry bones? Do you think these dry bones could live again, Ezekiel? And Ezekiel said what I would have said. Ah, only you would know that, God. And God says, Ezekiel, prophesy to these bones. Speak your truth, speak the, the truth of God to these bones, that's what he says. And so Ezekiel does it. And you know what it says in the story? It says there was a rattling sound and the bones, they started coming together. All these dry bones and, and then they weren't dry anymore. There were tendons, there was, there was flesh, there was muscle. It, it all started coming together and there were these bodies, all of them. And you know, I think that's kind of where we are right now as a church. Over the last four weeks, we've been talking about the mission of God. And something in that has stirred in us, hasn't it? It's brought us together as a church family. We're ready for action. But there in the story, there was something that I didn't remember from when I had read that passage before. Right after it says all the bodies came together, it says this, but there was no life in the bodies. They were together, they were ready. The truth of God had made a difference, but there wasn't life there yet. And so God says to Ezekiel, now prophesy to the breath, prophesy to the wind, prophesy to the spirit. And when Ezekiel did that, it says the Holy Spirit came inside of the bodies and they came to life. And then it says this, and they became a vast army. Now listen, over the next four weeks, we're gonna prophesy to the breath. We're gonna talk about the power of the Holy Spirit in and among us that we might come to life for the mission of God, that we might be a vast army in the city of Tulsa and around the world. That's what's in store for you as we kick off this new series. Yeah, come on, you can celebrate that. <laughs> Pastor Witt has an incredible message for us this morning. We're gonna do something really neat at the end of our service, kind of come together as a family. You can be looking forward to that, but before we do, we do have to have this giving moment. I chucked what I was gonna say, so I'll just say this. It's time to give. Please give, okay? No inspiration today, just give. Let's honor God with our generosity. We got a couple ways to do that around here. You can go to cotm.info, click on the giving tab, and it'll give you some instructions how you can give digitally. You can take out your phone and just send a text message to 23101. Write in there the word give, and it'll explain to you how you can give through that medium. Man, you may wanna go old school and just have a check or some cash. There's some envelopes in the seat backs in front of you. The buckets will be passed here in a second. You can just drop that in there. 
Would you bow your heads with me right now and we'll pray over this time. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for being a loving Father who created us. Thank you for sending your precious Son to redeem us, to show us who you are and how to live. And oh God, thank you that you would send your Holy Spirit that his presence, that his power would be available to us so that we could live out your mission, God. And that's what these resources are gonna go to do. God, I pray that you would bless those who give, that they would understand they're a part of your great mission, the, the advancement of your kingdom. I pray that you would bless these gifts, that you would multiply them so that we could make a difference in our city and around the world. Thank you, God, for being generous to us so that we could be generous with what we have. We pray these things in Christ's name, amen. You know, one of the coolest things around here is that we have some amazing partnerships with some wonderful people and organizations around the city who are also passionate about fulfilling the mission of God. And one of those partnerships is with a group called Wings of Freedom. It's led by a pastor by the name of Pastor Dixie Pebworth. We've had a relationship with Dixie for a little while now. Let me tell you real quickly about Dixie. 20 years ago, Dixie found himself inside of Dick Connor Correctional Facility. That sounds familiar to you because we have a church that meets in that facility, but that's only been the last couple of years. 20 years ago, we weren't in that facility, but Jesus was, and Pastor Dixie met Jesus behind the bars of that prison. And when he got out, he knew what his mission was. It was to help people like him as they get out of incarceration, to meet the real Jesus, to be free from substance abuse, and to be integrated into society in a healthy and meaningful way. And he's been doing that for the last 20 years. He has an apartment complex here in Tulsa, specifically for this purpose, where he brings people in and he gives them dignity, a place to live, and a place to begin. He wants to get another apartment complex to continue that mission, and we, you, are partnering with him. This is what the resources go to. This is what our compassion offering is about. Pastor Mike Shields, our outreach pastor here at Central Church, got to bless Dixie this week with a very special gift. I want you to check this out. Dixie. It's so good to have you in. Good to see you. I love you, brother. I love you, too. This is a really special day for us, you know. I mean, um, I've known you for quite a few years, you know, with David and Tammy. We've watched you guys with an incredible ministry. And today is kind of the start of a very special day for all of us as we look at partnership moving forward. We see what you're doing, okay? And I think the Lord has actually he's called us to partner with you. You're reaching a group of people that that a lot of us can't reach because of your special gifts and the calling that the Lord's placed on your on your life. Okay, so we see that we want to celebrate it, but we also want to partner with that because the entire body of Christ has very unique members. Okay, and you have a very unique calling. And there's a scripture here that I want to read in Philippians one. Okay, that I really think summarizes this whole thing. This is what it says in Philippians 1, 3, 7. It says, I thank my God every time I remember you. Okay? And all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident in this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it out to completion until the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. You're doing an incredible work. We thank you for that. And it is an honor for us to present you with a check to further the vision that the Lord's placed on your heart with the Wings of Freedom program of taking men and women that come out of incarceration and helping them get restored. Restored with Christ, restored with themselves, and they're restored to community. So here's a check on behalf of Pastor Wet and Heather George and Church on the Move for $100,000 to make this happen. Wow. Thank you. 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 Hey, good morning, Church on the Move. 
Hey, I know the, the audio on that video was a little hard to hear. It sounded like you said we gave him $1,000, which would be awesome. You gave him $100,000 out of the Compassion Offering. Come on, don't you love being a part of a church that's generous, that's making a difference in our community? Awesome. Well, hey, good morning. My name is Whit, and uh, so glad to be here with you this morning. Let me welcome everybody who's joining us online. I got a couple of friends watching online this morning. Just want to say welcome to everybody out there from all over the place, all over the world who are watching and joining with us this morning. Did you get your notes when you came in? You should have got a new folder like this. Reach down and grab this. We're following along. We're taking notes together this morning. And uh, we're starting a new series today on the Holy Spirit. Can't wait to jump into that. But go ahead and open this up. Grab the notes out. If you didn't get a pen, our hosts will be in the aisles. You can grab a pen from them. If you didn't get even one of these, we'll get you one of these so that you can uh, take notes with us, follow along with us. We're in a year of living on mission. And our theme verse for the year comes from John chapter 20, verse 21. We've been looking at it the last several weeks. It says this. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. And then he said this. He's speaking to his disciples, but we're just kind of, as disciples of Christ here, we're just kind of claiming this verse as our own. And Jesus said this, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. We believe that as a church, we're sent, that we're living a year on mission, getting outside the walls of our church, stepping into our communities, into our neighborhoods, loving people, living out God's mission. How many of you know God has a mission? God has a plan. God has a purpose. You're not here to live out your mission. You're here to live out God's mission. We don't serve a Home Depot-style God that says, you can do it, God can help. It's the opposite of that. We believe that God has done it and you can help. And that's what the mission of God is all about, is that we submit our lives to Christ, to the Lordship of Christ. We come under his authority, under his mission, and we say, okay, God, how can you use me? That's what this verse is all about. But I want you to look at the very next verse, John 20. 22, Jesus continued, and he, with that, he breathed on them. That's significant. And he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. We're starting a new series today on the Holy Spirit because you cannot fulfill the mission of God without the Holy Spirit of God. It's the Holy Spirit who empowers us, the Holy Spirit who equips us, the Holy Spirit that makes ministry and the mission of God possible. <clears throat> and as we walk through the scriptures today, I think you're going to see that clearly. But as I start to talk about the Holy Spirit, and really anytime anybody starts talking in depth about the Holy Spirit, there's a lot of feelings that come with that for a lot of different people. Depending on where you come from, what your theological background is, what your church tradition background is, people feel different things. Some of you when I mention the Holy Spirit, we start talking about the infilling of the Holy Spirit, you get excited because you know what life change you've experienced because of your relationship with the Holy Spirit and what he has meant to you and in your life. Others of you, it's quite the opposite experience. You approach this topic with trepidation, maybe with a little fear, with a little hesitation, maybe even a little bit of doubt, and maybe that's tied to past church experience. Maybe you had a, a church experience way back when where people did some weird stuff, Maybe your grandma used to go to a Pentecostal church and you saw some strange things, people running in the aisles, people rolling on the floor, maybe people barking like animals or whatever, and you're like, I don't know what I think about all this. And maybe you went to a church that said, hey, this is of the devil, this is something weird, we're not meant to do this kind of thing. And so when we talk about the Holy Spirit, we have a lot of different mixed feelings and emotions. I remember my first encounter with the Holy Spirit, really. Being maybe 14, 15 years old, I was at a church service, and we'd had a guest come in from out of town. It was a, a special church service. I don't exactly remember why we were meeting, but we're there in the church service at youth group, and this guest from out of town is preaching and speaking, and it becomes pretty obvious because I'd kind of seen this thing before, that they weren't going to leave that service. Nothing was going to end until they had prayed for every single person in the room. They were going to have an altar call and everybody, they were going to get everybody. You ever been at one of those services where the preacher's just going to make sure that everybody has to come down, everybody gets prayed for? And so as an introvert, I'm standing at the back of the room feeling apprehensive. 
nervous because I'm like, I don't want to be a part of this. I don't like this. I don't want to go down front and be prayed for. I don't want people touching me. I don't want to respond in the Holy Spirit. I don't, I don't know any of this kind of thing. I don't want to be a part of this. But as the service wears on and on and on, and it becomes clearer and clearer and clearer that they're not going to stop until every single person is prayed for, I reluctantly raised my hand, went down front to be prayed for. So I'm here feeling confused. I don't know whether or not God is in this or if this is just something they're forcing on me. And so I'm standing there a little apprehensive, not even sure why I'm there, just there to be prayed for. And so they come to pray for me, but not just them. They get other kids from the youth group to surround me. Now, did I mention I don't like being touched? So I've got all these people surrounding me, pressing in on me. Here I am, an introvert just standing there like this, just all these people. It's hot. It's sweaty. I don't know what to do. I'm not sure if they want me to respond or whatever. And so they're praying over me, and I can't even remember what they prayed. But I did ascertain a little bit into the prayer that they were wanting me to fall down. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but people falling under the power of the Spirit. And I was able to gather that because... Uh, the lady who was praying for me was pushing my head so far back that my head was about to pop off of my neck. <laughs> so I did the only thing that I could do. I gave them what's called a courtesy drop. I just went down <laughs> because I knew there was no other way out. So I was just like, maybe if I fall over, they'll leave me alone. So I technically fell under the power of God. I don't know if you could really qualify it as that. I got up later, nothing had changed, and I, I came away from that experience feeling a little confused, feeling a little used, wondering what just happened. Maybe some of you can relate to that. Maybe for some of you, when we start talking about the Holy Spirit, those are the feelings that you feel. That's the apprehension that goes through your heart and so as we approach this topic, I just want you to know from my perspective as a church, we're not here to force anything on anybody. We're not here to make anybody do anything. I'm not here to make anybody or put anybody in an uncomfortable position. And can I tell you, I don't think that's what God wants either. I don't think God is after anything weird. I don't think the Holy Spirit is weird. But as we approach this topic, I, I, I just pray that we could approach this topic with openness. So here's what I'm going to ask for all of us. No matter what your theological tradition is, your background, wherever you come from, whatever your experience with the Holy Spirit is, I'm just going to ask you to set what you've heard before aside for a second. Set your feelings aside and just say, okay, I want to open up and I want to just learn about this and see who God, the Holy Spirit, is. Because as we talk about this, what you need to know is that this is a massive topic. And a very difficult thing to talk about. Theologians over the years have struggled to talk about the Holy Spirit. The great Puritan genius John Owen wrote a two-volume like tome on the Holy Spirit. But here's what he said about what he wrote. He said this, this is a work too great for me and too difficult for me to undertake and beyond my ability to manage the glory of God or the good of men for who is sufficient for these things? When we talk about the Holy Spirit, we're talking about a massive topic, and that's because the Holy Spirit isn't an it. He's a he. He's a person. We have owner's manuals for things. You don't have owner's manual for relationship. And so when we're talking about God, it's kind of like when we come to this topic, where it's just so big and the Holy Spirit is so big, and as we're going to see, he's all through the Scripture. There are over 300 references to the Holy Spirit in the New Testament alone. So it, it's a topic so big that we just struggle to kind of wrap our arms around it all. And yet, I think this is something that we have to talk about. Because if we're going to accomplish the mission of God, we need the Holy Spirit of God. And so we're going to pray this morning. We're going to pray... Not only that my voice holds up, um, I think it's interesting, by the way, on the weekend that we're talking about the Holy Spirit, my voice goes out, the sound system at South uh, goes out, they finally got it up and running. It's almost like somebody doesn't want us talking about these things. But we're just going to pray this morning that God not only uh, sustains me as we pray, but I want to pray for you, that our hearts would be open and that the Holy Spirit would speak. 
This isn't really about me. It's about the Holy Spirit. And we just want to pray that God reveals himself to us in an honest and uh, approachable way. So would you bow your heads with me as we pray this morning? Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we just pause for a moment. And we choose right here and now, whatever our background is, whether we've been churched, unchurched, whether we've had experience with uh, the Holy Spirit or what's called the Holy Spirit or whatever, um, we just choose to set that aside. And we want to take, Lord, an honest, fresh look at the scripture to let you reveal yourself for who you are. We dare not bring our presuppositions, our assumptions about who you are to this conversation. But Lord, we want to see you for who you are. So we want to get out of the way and just learn from you. Holy Spirit, come. Work. Speak as only you can. And Father, uh, sustain my voice as I speak this morning and share what I believe you've put on my heart for this church body to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, grab your outline because we're going to start filling in the blanks. So grab your pen and we're going to start looking at scripture. The first thing I have for you is this. The Holy Spirit is at work throughout scripture. All right, you're going to see that that's undeniable. From the very beginning, we see the work of the Holy Spirit. What we want to do is approach the scriptures and to say, okay, how does the Spirit work? And in what ways does the Holy Spirit work? So let's look at Genesis chapter 1. In fact, this is the very beginning. It's amazing that right from the very beginning of Scripture, we see the Holy Spirit working. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2, and the earth was formless and empty and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And check it out, the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. In Hebrew, this word for Spirit of God, which is going to repeat all throughout the Old Testament, is this word ruach. Let's all just say that together because it's a kind of fun word to say. Ruach. Yeah, sounds like a new truck that GMC is coming out with. The GMC ruach. You know, it's, just, it's, it's a fun word. But it means breath. It means wind. And so here we see right from the beginning, God is acting. This is creation, Genesis 1, 1, 1, and 2, right? And what we see is that as God acts, who's there with him? The Holy Spirit, the breath, the ruach of God, working to create. And so what happens right after Genesis 1, 2? Well, right after this, creation starts to form. So we see here that the Holy Spirit shows up and life starts to happen. Look again, uh, we're going to look at our next verse in Exodus 31, we're looking here at the story of a guy named Bezalel. This is fascinating because Bezalel was a craftsman. He was an artist. And Bezalel's an interesting guy and a unique guy because he is, check this out, the very first person in all of Scripture that God himself says, I have placed my spirit on this person. Bezalel. This is Exodus chapter 31, verse 3. Look at this. I have filled, this is God speaking, he says, I have filled Bezalel with the Spirit of God. That's that word ruach again, the breath of God. I've filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and look at this, and in all kinds of craftsmanship. Now, isn't that fascinating? Because when we think about the Holy Spirit coming on somebody, in fact, just go to YouTube and Google Holy Spirit or search for Holy Spirit coming on somebody. What are you going to see? You're going to see this emotional response. You might see people dancing. You might see people running. You might see people rolling around on the floor. That's not what we see with Bezalel. We see the Spirit of God, the Ruach of God coming on him, and he had the capacity to craft things. So Bezalel was an artist. He worked with his hands. He was a craftsman. Have you ever thought about the Holy Spirit working in you that way? Are you a designer? Are you an architect? Do you work with your hands? Are you a mechanic? Are you a carpenter? Have you ever thought that the Holy Spirit could empower you to work in that way? That's exactly what we see here with Bezalel. These things are not just for emotional response, but we see the Holy Spirit is the empowerment of God to do God's work. What was Bezalel building? What was he crafting? Well, he was crafting the tabernacle. 
the place where God would meet. Last night I was talking to one of my best friends in all the world, Hank Speaker, who is an architect, been a part of our church for a long time. And Hank is the architect who led a team of people who redesigned this auditorium. And he was talking about, when we were talking, because he was at the service last night, and he was talking about Bezalel, and we were talking about this section of scripture, and he said, you know, that's amazing. He said, because I thought about that whenever we were designing this room. And he said, as we were thinking about how to lay out this room and the colors that we would use, I just felt like I was impressed to go back and read about the colors that were used in the tabernacle, and that's why we chose the colors of the seats that are in this room. That's the Holy Spirit of God working on a craftsman, on an artist, to fulfill the work and mission of God. Isn't that cool? Here's another example of this. Judges chapter 15, we see the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord, it says, came upon Samson with power. Now, this is interesting because in the NLT here, which is the version we're using, it says that it came upon, the Spirit of God came upon Samson with power. In the ESV, you'll see it says that the, the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon Samson. And that word rushed in Hebrew is a word that means to advance or to prosper, to make successful. I think that's interesting because in the New Testament, it says that when the Holy Spirit comes on the day of Pentecost, he filled the room like a mighty rushing wind. So here we see the power of God coming on Samson in this powerful way to do what? Well, what happens? Well, it says the ropes on Samson's arms became as weak as a burning plant, and they fell from his hands. And then check it out. Next verse. Samson found a jawbone of a donkey and took it in his hand, and he killed a thousand men. Now, when we talk about Samson in the church, and anytime maybe you grew up in church and you had, you know, Sunday school pictures where you had to draw or color things in or whatever, and you saw illustrations of Samson, how did he look? He always looked buff. He was always like Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, some huge guy filled with muscles, that kind of guy. I don't think Samson was a muscly guy. I think the Spirit of the Lord came on him, and he was able to do exploits. I don't think it was because he was big and strong and tough. I think he was the opposite of big and strong and tough. I think he probably looked something more like, I don't know, Lee. Where, where are you at, Lee? Yeah, more like Lee, right? So people were going, how is this possible? The Spirit of the Lord came on him. I love Lee. He's doing a great job. Are you guys enjoying having Lee at the center? It's so good. We love you, Lee. But it wasn't because of Samson's power, it was the Holy Spirit who came on Samson to empower him. We see the same thing with David. Look at 1 Samuel chapter, what is it, 16. So Samuel took the horn of oil. Samuel's a prophet. And oil is, in the Old Testament is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. It's one of the metaphors that's used for us to understand the Holy Spirit. So here we see Samuel taking a horn of oil, nothing special, and the oil itself, it's representative of the Spirit of God. And so the horn of oil, and he anoints David in the presence of his brothers, and from that day on, look at this, the Spirit, the Ruach of God, came powerfully, that's that same word, rushing, that, that word that means to advance, to prosper. And so the Spirit of God comes on David. In this case, what for? To lead. David was to be king. He was to guide and govern God's people. And so the Spirit of God comes on him to empower him for his leadership task. We see the same idea reflected in Jesus. Interestingly, when the angel appears to Mary, uh, what does he say to Mary? He says, the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, the Ruach of God, will come on you and you'll conceive and have a son. But then check this out. Most of Jesus' life, his childhood, his early life, I should say, his childhood, we know almost nothing about. We get some stories of his birth. We have one story of when he was 12 years old. After that, nothing until this story that we get in uh, Luke chapter 3. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. This is John the Baptist baptizing people. And as he was praying, this is Jesus, heaven was opened. And look at this. The Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. So we have no record of Jesus doing any miracles when he was a child. In fact, I'm not sure that he did anything. Nothing is recorded. And I, I think that's significant, and I think we can ascertain that or gather that because when Jesus started doing miracles, 
His family didn't believe it. And his family didn't believe in him. If he'd been performing this stuff since he was a kid, everybody would be going, check it out. This is my son. Watch what he can do. This is amazing. But they didn't believe in him early on. Now, they did later, but they didn't early on. So what is this? Well, the power of God, the Holy Spirit of God, comes on Jesus, anoints him, and empowers him for what? For ministry. Look what happens in the very next chapter. After Jesus returned from the wilderness, so right after he's baptized, he goes into the wilderness to be tempted. There's a lot going on there theologically. Not going to jump into it today. But he comes back from the wilderness in the power, look at this phrase, in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And a report about him went out through all the surrounding country. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And what you see right after this, if you keep reading Luke chapter 4, is you find that miracles start to happen right after this. What's happening? The Holy Spirit comes on him and power, power. What are we seeing? That whenever God moves, there you also find the work of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit empowers the work of God. That's what we see over and over again, from creation to Bezalel to Samson to David. I could go on and on and on to Christ. Look even further. We see this happening with the church. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus tells his disciples, do not leave Jerusalem. Don't start doing any ministry yet. Don't do anything. I want you to wait first. What are they waiting for? He says, you're going to wait here for the promise of the Father. And in Acts 1.8, a verse we've been looking at a lot lately, but Jesus said this, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will receive power. And in that way, you will be my witnesses, but only when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And it's amazing in Acts 1, we see this incredible change come over the disciples when the Holy Spirit comes. A new boldness, a new power, a new empowerment for ministry and miracles start to happen. The church explodes, but only after the Holy Spirit comes and empowers them. Again, same, same thing we see over and over, over and over again. We see the work of God being empowered by the Holy Spirit. One more reference I want to look at, and then we'll start to try to tie all this together. All right, 2 Timothy 3.16, this is Paul writing to Timothy, and he's writing to Timothy about Scripture. Look at what he says. He says, Timothy, all Scripture, all Scripture is, and look at this phrase, God breathes. Remember what we said about the Ruach? Now, this is not a Hebrew word because Paul didn't write in Hebrew. He wrote in Greek. But I think he's alluding to, and it's very clear, he's alluding to the Holy Spirit when he says, God breathed. He says, all scripture is inspired by the work of the Holy Spirit. So what does that mean? It means that when men sat down to write the books of the Bible, it means that the Holy Spirit moved on them. It doesn't mean that they were taken over and in some kind of a trance and they wrote with their eyes closed and the pen just kind of moved by itself. It means that the Holy Spirit guided their thoughts and words so that what they wrote down was inspired. That's what we call it. It's inspired by the Holy Spirit. And we believe that that means it's inerrant and infallible. So we believe when we read the scripture, we believe that every single word of scripture, including the way the books were put together. So you hear about different books, different gospels, the book of Enoch, uh, the gospel of Mary Magdalene, stuff like that. There's some interesting other readings out there, but we believe that the Holy Spirit not only guided the, the way the scripture was written, but also the church who selected what books would be in the final canon. So we believe that scripture... But, but here's why I brought this up. Because from creation to the creation of Scripture, we see the Holy Spirit is the one behind this, guiding this, empowering this. What, what does this mean? Well, if I was going to sum it all up, here's the summarization statement. Get your pens ready. The Holy Spirit is the empowering presence of God. The empowering presence of God for the mission of God both to us and through us. We say that again. The Holy Spirit is the empowering presence of God for the mission of God, both to us and through us. Now, I want to unpack this for just a minute because we chose this statement very carefully. 
as pastors. And these words, empowering presence, are significant. Because as we look through Scripture, what we see over and over and over again is that it's the Holy Spirit who empowers the work of God. So again and again, when God wants to accomplish something, whether that's in the work of creation, whether that's through Bezalel the craftsman to build the tabernacle, whether that's through David to lead God's people, whether that's through Jesus to fulfill the role of Messiah, whether that's through the church, we see the Holy Spirit at work in all of those situations. So the Holy Spirit is the empowering presence of God to fulfill God's mission. So the Holy Spirit is, this, is, is a person, but he's a, he provides power, and he's a force that creates or makes the will of God and the mission of God possible. And as we said last week, the mission of God is something that's both to us and through us. So the mission of God is for you, but it's also something God wants to do through you. So let me kind of break down how that works, both talking about the word empowering and the word presence, because both of those words are significant, and we chose them for a very specific reason. So let's talk about how the Holy Spirit empowers us for the mission of God to us, working in us. The Holy Spirit is the power of God given to you to transform your life. When you give your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes into you. You're given a new spirit, but also God's spirit comes into your, your heart, and in, in that way, you are now empowered to live out and become like Christ in a new way. I, and I have seen this happen with different people I've seen come out of the kingdom of darkness, people who are living for themselves, they cross over the line of faith, and they get a new, a new power, a new presence, a new empowerment to live out this new Christian life. I have a friend who just came to Christ in the last year. And watching him go from where he was and all the desires that he used to have, the habits that he used to have, and then he gives his life to Christ, and it's incredible. His life turns upside down. It's a complete 180. All of the things that he used to do, he doesn't want to do anymore. He's lost the desire for those things. What's amazing is that he, that he has a whole new set of desires. Whereas before he didn't want to read scripture, whereas before he could care less about sermons, whereas before he didn't want to learn about God or listen to anyone talk about God, now he's calling me, texting me, talking to me about the latest sermon that he listened to. That's mind-blowing because just a few weeks before, you would have never heard that from him. In fact, if you were to talk to God or talk to him about God, he would have gotten angry, upset with you. What is that? That's the Holy Spirit empowering him to become like Christ. And by the way, that's what the Holy Spirit does. Everything the Holy Spirit does points to Christ. So he's conforming us into the image of Christ. He's changing us. We see the same thing as the Holy Spirit empowers us, though, for the mission of God through us. So the Holy Spirit empowers us to become like Christ ourselves, but then the Holy Spirit works in us so that we can lead people to Christ as well. So that's a mission of God through us. I have a great story about this. We, um, as a leadership team here at the church, we've just been taking this mission of God thing personally. And we've just said, hey, this isn't going to happen in our church if we're not living this out ourselves. And so in our you know, group text thread, we're texting each other. We're spurring one another on to good works and just sharing how we're reaching out and uh, sharing our faith and engaging people uh, you know, around us. And so uh, I got a text from our pastor at our Broken Arrow Church, Ethan Vance, the other day. He sent it to our group. And he just said, hey, cool story, the Holy Spirit working in me. He said, I, I was driving to get my car washed. And if you know anything about Pastor Ethan, you know he's a neat freak. So his car is always spotless. He was going to the car wash to get this little speck off of it. And so, <laughs> so he's headed to his favorite car wash. And as he's driving over there, he says he just feels, it's just a sense, not a voice, no light from heaven, no, oh, you know, none of that. No angels saying, just a sense, I don't need to go to this car wash. I I'm not supposed to go. Didn't sense danger, just sense I, I need to go someplace else. Feels weird, not sure what to do with that. So he says, okay, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm not, I'll trust that. So he says, I'm going to go to a different car wash. He goes to a different car wash, one of the car washes where you, you have to get out of your car, you're not just pulling through, but you get out, 
And so he gets out of his car, and his car is going through, and he, he walks into the lobby. He opens up the door to the lobby, and who's sitting there in the lobby? But somebody that he's been praying for to have an interaction with to lead to Christ. Now, this is incredible. He just said, he said, all I could do was smile and laugh because, wow, what is that? That's the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit in your life for the mission of God through you. And it's amazing, I think, if we would start to listen, the Holy Spirit wants to do far more through you than you could possibly imagine. Sometimes we think, oh, I don't have what it takes. Well, I'm not a pastor. I'm not one of those kinds of people. Well, let me set you at ease. Jesus said this, you can do nothing without me. Let's just say that nothing word together. He said you could do nothing, not some things, not a few things, not a little bit, nothing without me. So you're helpless as it is, and so am I. So we're all dependent upon the power and work of the Holy Spirit, the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. So that's what the empowering looks like. Now, this word presence is also significant. We chose the word presence because the Holy Spirit is not just an energy. He is not just a force. He is not just a power. The Holy Spirit is a he. He's a person. He's a presence. And this is good news. Because it means that God is close to us. We don't just know God through our head knowledge. We don't just know him through doctrine or study of scripture, although those are wonderful. I'm not trying to minimize that at all. But we don't just know God with our brain, but through the Holy Spirit, we can experience an intimacy with God that you couldn't otherwise experience. And I believe God is an experiential God. Not just a God of knowledge, not just a God that we approach through the mind, but that we can experience in our heart and in our soul. Just yesterday, yeah, we have a prayer service. By the way, if you didn't know, we pray every, the first service of our weekend here at the Central Campus is at 9 a.m. on Saturdays. I would invite you to come. This is my favorite service that we do. We pray for about 30 to 45 minutes. We worship and we pray together and we pray over our weekend services. And so I was here yesterday with so many others, and we were praying. We just walked through the auditorium, through the building, through the halls, and just pray, pray for you. And, and so we're praying over this weekend, and I'm sitting right over here in the seat, and the band is playing, and it's just quiet, and I'm just worshiping God. And as I'm worshiping God, I just find myself, I just have my hands right here, and I'm just thinking and just feeling. I feel your presence. I, I, I'm experiencing you. Right now, this is more than just words coming out of my mouth, but I'm experiencing you. That's the Holy Spirit, the empowering presence, which means there's a closeness to our relationship with God. Some of you who have experienced a deeper relationship with the Holy Spirit, you know exactly what I'm talking about, because before you experienced that, you had a knowledge of God, but it felt dry, and it felt mechanical, and maybe it even felt a little bit distant, but then you learned about the Holy Spirit, and there was this newness, this freshness, this life, this relationship that came. What is that? That's the Holy Spirit. Spirit, and that's that presence, and that presence, that closeness goes with us wherever we go. That's the good news, is that it's not just there when I'm reading scripture, and he's not just there when I'm, you know, at church or worshiping, but the Holy Spirit is with me wherever I go to work in me, to reveal things to me, to purify me. Just last week after I preached at the 11 o'clock service, I, uh, I went home, I'm tired, you know, preaching three times a weekend is, is exhausting, and so you, you, know, you put all this effort into it, and after you know, uh, the Sunday service, you go home and kind of crash. It's a, it's a holy hangover, you could say. <laughs> and so I, I go home, and I, actually, I'm on my way home, and I'm going to stop by Chipotle to get a burrito. I'm hungry, so I, I need a Chipotle burrito in my life real bad. But Heather calls me, and she's out running errands, and she goes, hey, you know what? I, I can grab that burrito for you, or I can go to Chipotle for you. Just text me your order, and I'll pick it up for you. That's cool. So I, I go home. I get my phone. I text my order. I want a burrito. 
I order the same thing at Chipotle every time. It doesn't change. I get a burrito, no rice, both beans, double chicken, and a lot of shredded cheese. That's my, that's my jam. Any of you, you do the same thing every time you go someplace. You're just consistent like that. You don't, you don't like to mix it up. Heather likes to mix it up. I don't understand that. We'll go to a restaurant, and Heather will be like, oh, I love this thing that I ordered last time. I'm going to get something different. Why? You love that. It was great. Just get it again. She likes to do new things, though. I don't want to, let's not try something new. Let's just go with the same old thing that always works. Amen? Come on, there, there you go, my consistent people. Anyway, so I wanted my Chipotle burrito. Heather said, text me your order. I did. I got home, and my kids, a couple of my kids wanted something as well, so I start texting their orders as well, and then I start thinking about it. I know Heather. I should text my order again. So I send her my order two times, two times via text. This is my order, a burrito. I want double chicken. I want no, you know, the whole thing. So I send her a video. Finally, after an hour, I am starving. I am ready. She's been at Home Depot. Finally, she comes home. I'm like, thank God she's here. She, she comes outside. I'm sitting outside at our outdoor table, and I'm sitting out there. She comes out with the Chipotle bag, and there on the top, there's two bowls in there, and there's a burrito, and I grab the burrito, and instantaneously, I knew something. Do you, you ever have that feeling? That's a work of the Holy Spirit. I knew it's too light. It's too light. Something's wrong. What happened? I'm like, what happened to my burrito? This feels too small. She goes, oh, that's not your burrito. I'm like, what are you talking about? She goes, I got you a bowl. I said, I did not order a bowl. I ordered a burrito. Now I'm mad. I'm angry. I, I said I wanted a burrito. She goes, oh, I'm so sorry. I th your text said a bowl. I said, no, it did not. I got out my phone. I showed it to her twice. Burrito, double chicken, both beans, no rice, extra cheese. Like, that's my thing. I'm, I'm, at this point, I'm furious. All I wanted in the world, a man is preaching. He's giving his heart to the church. All he needs is a burrito. Just get the man his burrito. Am I right? So I, I'm mad. So Heather is like, well, I'm sorry. And I'm like, I don't know if I can eat this bowl. I, I, don't, I don't know. I might have to go to Chipotle myself. She's like, just eat the bowl. I, I, and so, so she, she walks out to the yard. She's going to take care of our chickens. We have chickens, you guys. Chickens. I live in Tulsa. We have chickens. I got eight chickens. I don't know what's going on. This is my wife. We have chickens, dogs, five kids. It's like Green Acres up in here. I, I don't know what's going on. I just live there. So anyway, she's out tending to her chickens. And I am now opening up this bowl and I'm angry. I'm eating Chipotle mad, just shoveling it in. This is terrible. This is not what I wanted at all. And to make matters worse, there's barely any cheese. And I'm sitting there thinking, okay, she's out there with the chickens. When she comes back, we're going to have a talk about this cheese, too. That's the second failure. <laughs> How did we get here? So <laughs> the Holy Spirit, yes. Okay. I'm, I'm sitting there angrily eating this bowl of Chipotle. And as I'm eating... I, I hear this whisper down inside, can you be thankful? Can you be content with what you have? And, and, and this, is, this is what I, I heard. See, Paul writes in Philippians, some of you all know these verses. He says, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in plenty or in need, he said, I have learned the secret of contentment in all things. And then he says this, the verse that all the athletes like to write on their shoes doesn't mean what they think it means. I can do all things through Christ. What does that verse mean? It means whether I have a burrito or whether I have a bowl, I can deal with it. That's what that verse means. And here's what the Holy, now, now listen to me, because this is real. Here's what the Holy Spirit is saying. Like if you can't handle not having a burrito Versus a bowl? Like, how are you going to handle the bigger disappointments of life? See, we laugh about this and it feels small, but can I tell you, it's the small things that erode a relationship. 
Some of us, we're, we're thinking, oh, we need the Lord's help and the big things. Maybe, maybe we would transform and become more like Christ if we would start dealing with the little stuff, the stuff we just don't think all that matters all that much. And that's what the presence of the Holy Spirit is for. He's close to us, even in those quiet, intimate moments where nobody else is around, and you're alone with your thoughts, and you hear the whisper of the Holy Spirit, and what's he trying to do? He's trying to make me more like Christ. That's why he was given, so that I could be transformed, so that I don't have to be the same person that I was. So the Holy Spirit comes to us in this way, the empowering presence of God. I could talk about this forever. I'm already over on my time, so let's move on. Let me show you, though, where we're going over the next few weeks, because I want you to see how this works. Here's what we're going to talk about. Next week, we're talking about the Holy Spirit to you. And the Holy Spirit is given to you for all sorts of different things. I'm just highlighting a couple today. But the Holy Spirit is a gift that, there, there are so many aspects to this gift. Simon Ponsby, who wrote about the Holy Spirit in his book, a, a God Inside Out, he said that the Holy Spirit and the theology of the Holy Spirit touches on all aspects, all aspects of Christian doctrine, which means this is a huge topic. So the gift of the Holy Spirit to you is huge, and we want to talk about that next week. Uh, the week after that, we're talking about this, the Holy Spirit through you, through you. That's that empowering presence for the mission of God through you. And so we want to talk about that. And then lastly, we're going to talk about this, the Holy Spirit in you. And that's week four. And I'm just telling you, do not miss week four. Now let me just wrap this up quickly, and I want to move through this. I'm going to invite the band to come out. We're going to wrap this thing up here. Here's what I want you to see today. Is that the same Holy Spirit in Scripture is the same Holy Spirit available to me. Stop and think about that for a second. The same Holy Spirit that moved on the waters in creation came to life. The same Holy Spirit who worked in Bezalel. The same Holy Spirit who came on Samson. The same Holy Spirit who empowered David for leadership. The same Holy Spirit who empowered Jesus for the work of his ministry. The same Holy Spirit that launched the church. The same Holy Spirit that that inspired the scripture is the same Holy Spirit available to you. And if that's true, then what do we have to fear? Why would we be apprehensive? If we see the Holy Spirit at work in all these different ways, why wouldn't we say, I want more of this? I need more of the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life. And so here's my hope for us through this series is this, that God would give us an increasing desire for the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. You may say, well, I don't know how this works. I don't know what you're talking about. I've heard of this thing, speaking in tongues. That sounds weird to me. I don't understand that. I'm not asking you to agree to do anything. I'm just asking you to say, I, I'm just open to a, an increasing presence of the Holy Spirit in my life, whatever that looks like. I want more of the Holy Spirit because I'm about the mission of God both to me and through me. Second thing, my hope for this series is this, that we would see increasing evidence of the work of the Holy Spirit in our church and in you. There would be God moments, Holy Spirit moments like what Pastor Ethan had. Where you say, wow, wow, that's the Holy Spirit. You would hear that voice on the inside of you go, oh, and you would start to recognize it and realize, oh, that's the, the Holy Spirit at work in me. We're going to teach you how to do that over the next four weeks. But we want to see an increasing desire. We're going to close this service with a time of response. In fact, every week of this service, we're going to have an opportunity to respond. I believe that the gathering of the church together is more than just something that you attend but you are meant to participate. We're moving around a lot right now. No, I'm not upset about it, but I want you to hear me on this. You were meant to participate in the church, the gathering of the church. This isn't a one-way conversation. God wants to speak to you, and you speak back to God. That's what we, we worship. We speak, then God speaks. And now that God has spoken, not me, now that the word of God has spoken, I think it's only appropriate that we take some time to reflect and respond. So here in a moment, we're going to share in communion together. But before we do that, 
Maybe you're here this morning and you say, what, I'm not right with Christ. I'm not right with Jesus in this way. I have not bowed the knee of my life to Jesus. And I want to clarify that because a lot of people in this part of the world believe in Jesus. I don't believe salvation happens through a simple belief like that, so that we believe and then we have fire insurance and then one day we go to heaven. I don't think that's what Jesus, what it's talking about in scripture when we hear about this. What, what we're called to is an allegiance to Christ. That's devoting your life to him. That doesn't mean you have to be perfect, but that just means you're bowing the knee of your heart. A lot of people believe in Jesus. I'm talking about giving your life to him. Fundamentally different. That's why we call it meeting the real Jesus. If that's you this morning, heads bowed, eyes closed, I want to give you an opportunity to just say, that's me. Wherever you find yourself in this room, would you just slip up your hand and say, Whit, that's me. I need to meet the real Jesus today. I want to put Jesus at the center of my life. I need, a, I need, I need that. Help me. I, pray for me. Would you just slip your hand up wherever you find yourself? Just boldly put your hand up and say, that's me. I need to meet Jesus. Yeah, right here in front of me, all over the place. One, two, three in the center section. Thank you. Anybody else? I need Jesus. Just boldly put your hand up in the air and say, I need him in my life. You can't experience, yes, up here on the risers. You're not going to experience the, the work of the Holy Spirit until you surrender your life to Christ. So it starts there. Yes, ma'am, I see right here in front of me. Thank you. I, I see hands all over the place. All right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray out loud together. Church, you believe in what they're doing, so let's pray together. Say, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son to die on a cross for me. I confess I am a sinner. I need a savior. Jesus came for me. So I believe that he was raised from the dead. And I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. I am not Lord of my own life. Jesus is. Lord Jesus, I give you everything. Complete control. Take all of me and use me for your kingdom, for your purpose. Amen. Let's put our hands together for everybody who just prayed that prayer this morning. God bless you. Now I'm going to invite our host to come right now. We're going to take communion together. And as they're passing the elements of communion, you need to know there are two cups, one on top of the other. The juice is on top. The bread is in the bottom cup. Grab both cups when it comes down your row. I'm just going to ask that we just remain in an attitude of worship because right now, this is an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to speak to you. In fact, do you mind, guys, if we just bring the lights down a little bit? I just want us to be in an attitude of worship here as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper together. We're going to have an opportunity for the Lord to speak to us. So let's just quiet our hearts and just reflect on what God has spoken today. Maybe even ask Him, Lord, help me. Help me with this. Holy Spirit, speak to me. So I'm just going to back off for a second while the host passes the communion trays, and then we'll take communion together, and then we'll dismiss.
On the night before Jesus was crucified, he gathered with his disciples, and they celebrated Passover together. Only Jesus reappropriated an experience that they had had many, many times over. When he took the bread and he broke it, he said, this bread is my body, which is broken for you. And it's broken so that you could be healed, spirit, soul, and body. What sin has torn apart? He said, my body will be broken so that you could be put back together, made whole. Healing is available to us through the broken body of Jesus. So today, church, we remember the sacrifice of our Lord and his brokenness for us so that we could be whole as we take of the bread together. He took the cup. He said, this cup represents my blood that is shed for you. Later, Paul would write that without the shedding of blood, forgiveness of sins is impossible. Jesus shed his blood so that you wouldn't have to. The wrath of God was poured out on Christ so that we could be brought near, so that you, who were an outsider, exiled, cut off from the promises of God so that we could be brought into God's family, that all happens because of this cup. Jesus poured out his blood. So today, we remember as we drink of this cup together. Thank you, Jesus. And now, Lord, we just say thank you. Give us, over the next four weeks and beyond, an increasing desire for your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come. Work, move in your people. Not so that we may be entertained, be wowed, but so that the mission of God could be fulfilled both to us and through us. We want to see you at work. So give us an increasing desire with increasing evidence. And Lord, we believe that as we ask, we will receive. As we seek, we will find. As we knock, the door will be open. Because that's what you promised us. Thank you, Lord, for your abiding presence that goes with us wherever we are. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand to your feet. Two things before I dismiss you. Two things. One, if you lifted your hand to receive Christ after we leave, as you exit, you're going to see tables out in the lobbies that just say, I raise my hand. There's a book there for you. It's the Gospel of John. Grab that. No strings attached. This is our gift to you today. Second thing, maybe you're here today and you say, wait, I have been filled with the Holy Spirit. I know exactly what you're talking about when you talk about that. And I am passionate about other people receiving the gift and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Uh, would you hang just after the service, five minutes, that's all I need. Everybody else is gonna leave, you just hang in here, come down front, I just wanna talk to you for just a second, got a quick request for you, if you would just hang back, all right? Everybody else, the Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you, give you peace, God bless you. You're dismissed.